States Army presents The Big Picture, an official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. Fantasy? Not at all. What you see on the screen at this moment, and will see in greater detail a bit later in this film, is a glimpse of the United States Army in the years that lie just ahead of us. This is a report on the Army's effort to prepare for the challenges of that future. It is a report on the Army's effort to achieve a sharper sword and stronger shield with which it can do its assigned part in preserving the peace, or if necessary, defending the nation and the free world against whatever enemy might rise against it. This is the Soviet army on parade, showing off its manpower and its weapons. The event is a recent Moscow celebration of the Soviet Communist Revolution. Their marching men and rumbling tanks, their massive and powerful weapons, are part of the largest land army on Earth today. The Soviet army has under arms in its ground forces alone two and a half million men, organized into 175 combat line divisions, most of them armored type. To see the strength of the Soviet army within the perspective of the entire communist world, we must take cognizance of the large standing armies of the USSR's European satellites. Red China, North Korea, and North Vietnam. Together, these communist countries have in being armies totaling more than four million men. With this strength behind it, what kind of warfare is the Soviet Union preparing for? Indications are strong that the most probable threat posed to us may not be from the long-range bomber or the ICBM. The Soviets are concentrating today on the expansion, training, and equipping of the army and supporting forces. The Soviets do have the capability of starting an all-out nuclear war, but there is little doubt that they are aware that that kind of war would bring untold devastation upon them. On the contrary, however, they know that they can unleash, and with every hope from their point of view of winning, a major land war of any dimension, short of total thermonuclear holocaust. To meet the threat of land warfare involving large numbers of well-equipped communist troops, the United States has a combined arms team, which includes the Army, the Navy and Marines, and the Air Force. We also have a strong reserve, which stands ready to support each of our services. In this combined arms team, it is the Army which is charged with the primary responsibility of engaging the land forces of an enemy. This report is based on the assumption that ground combat will be necessary in any war initiated by communist forces. To assume less, to be prepared for less, is to put our nation in certain jeopardy if war does come. And beyond that fact, is to endanger the peace itself. Since our nation's policy is built on the belief that in our strength lies the only sure deterrent to our potential enemy's aggression. How then could and would our army counter the threat posed by the Soviet army if that threat became reality? Not by numbers. Our army is a force of less than 900,000 compared with the Soviets' two and a half million. But we do not stand alone, of course. Our divisions are the spearhead, so to speak, of a force which includes the 200 divisions of our allies whom we help train and sustain with aid and for whom our army must serve as an example. 
our NATO allies add more than two million men to the forces of the free world. We are equipping them with as many modern weapons as possible. Our Southeast Asian allies have nearly 400,000 men, and our other Asian allies contribute more than a million. This is not to suggest an equalization of strength, for altogether, the forces of the free world are about three million less than the communist bloc. But it is not the policy of this nation to attempt to match the Soviets man for man. How then does our army propose to match their greater well-equipped numbers? First of all, it must be able to respond immediately at the nation's will to any kind of trouble anywhere in the world which threatens our national interest or threatens to erupt into large-scale war. Our army must be flexible enough to provide whatever forces are needed in conjunction with its sister services to handle any emergency wherever it occurs. To handle it by stamping it out or localizing it before it engulfs the world in the Holocaust of war. But the ability to respond quickly is not in itself enough. The army must not only be able to arrive quickly on the scene of danger, it must arrive with enough power to accomplish its mission with, if you will, a sharper sword. And as it gains supremacy with its sharper sword, it must at the same time have a stronger shield with which it can ward off whatever is thrown against it and hold the supremacy it has won. What constitutes a sharper sword and stronger shield? The answer to that is the substance of this report. Qualitative strength, modern weapons, tailored to the conditions of war today and tomorrow, and the equipment which makes them effective. The new Pentomic Division is composed of five smaller, more powerful units called battle groups. The battle group, a symbol of today's recast army, is designed to fight however conditions dictate in any kind of battle situation. This is what a battle group looks like, massed for photographic purposes. A powerful force of some 1,500 men and the equipment which sustains them in combat. In tactical situations, of course, the battle group would never appear massed. Indeed, throughout this film, you will see combat scenes of men and machines grouped together for photographic convenience, but entirely unrealistic in terms of the conditions of the atomic battle area of tomorrow. The battle group is designed to fight under fluid conditions, widely dispersed over great distances, its units coming together to deliver a massive blow at the enemy, then rapidly dispersing again to deny the enemy a lucrative target, constantly moving, grouping, shifting, a lean, powerful fighting machine. The battle group, to repeat, is a building block, one of five similar units which make up a division. Depending on the type of division the battle group is part of, infantry, airborne, or armored, it is able to call on powerful weapons and equipment in support. Here are some of them. Some of the vehicles which give an airborne division its mobile capability on the ground. The aircraft which provide its tactical aerial mobility. The maintenance and supply vehicles of an infantry division. The medical equipment which provides care for the wounded in the field. The steel and power of an armor division's infantry battalion. The tough and mobile strength of an armor division's tank battalion. The communications vans and equipment which preserve the division's chain of command in combat. The heavy equipment 
which provides bridges and builds roads for an armored division. The massive wheeled vehicles of the armored division's quartermaster battalion, which carry the astronomical amounts of gasoline and other supplies necessary to keep an armored division in combat. Powerful destructive weapons of the division artillery. And behind these stand corps and field army artillery. What you have seen here is a massive display of the items each of the army's battle groups and the supporting units in its parent division should have in order to be at the peak of effectiveness as effectiveness is measured today. Meeting and maintaining this demand is a challenge that faces not only the army, but the nation as well. It is not an easy task, nor an inexpensive one. To fully equip an airborne division today costs almost $40 million. An infantry division, more than $59 million. An armored division, $124 million. Nor does the challenge end there. Equipping for top effectiveness is not a one-time operation. Technology's advance is constantly at work, improving certain items, making others obsolete. And the Army must keep abreast of this advance, adapting and changing as conditions dictate. For yesterday's finest weapons become today's second best, and tomorrow are inadequate. And inadequate weapons do not win battles, nor indeed in war, is there a prize for second best? Let us now look more closely at examples of what the Army presently has and where improvements are needed, beginning with the battle group. The battle group is the largest maneuver element in the Pentomic Division, with the ability to disperse into smaller units over an area of considerable distance. We will consider first the firepower in a battle group. The soldier's best friend in combat is his rifle. The M1 and the carbine, with which army troops are armed at the present time, are good serviceable weapons which have performed well in the past. But exhaustive testing by the army has brought about a new weapon better suited to the battle area of tomorrow. Lighter and more powerful, it is intended to displace three current types of shoulder-fired weapons, and the army is working earnestly to get it into the hands of its soldiers. Also, it has developed a new lighter weight general purpose machine gun, which is more effective than the light machine gun it is designed to replace. Heavy mortar is now organic to the battle group. To replace it with a weapon with a range equal to or better than ranges of present medium conventional artillery, the army has a need for a self-propelled weapon combining the short range features of the mortar with the long range abilities of the howitzer. The battle group needs a lightweight, mobile, primarily atomic missile with a range equal to or better than ranges of present medium conventional artillery. And the Army is developing such a missile now. These are some of the weapons intended to increase the firepower of a battle group. Behind the battle group at the battle group's parent division must stand weapons powerful enough to operate within a large area a division must cover. The first rocket to be assigned to the division is the Honest John, which can deliver a warhead, either atomic or high explosive, to targets 15 miles away. The Army plans to replace it with a smaller lightweight version. Behind the division, weapons of even greater firepower must be available in the core area, which covers 50 to 100 miles on a side. The Lacrosse is a surface-to-surface -surface guided missile. The Army needs this weapon to fill the requirement for an accurate, destructive all-weather system capable of close support of ground troops for the core area. The Corporal, a medium-range guided missile which can deliver atomic or non-atomic fire within a 70-mile zone, 
gives the Army a core weapon to augment close tactical air support and artillery fire. The Sergeant, now in production, has approximately the same range as the Corporal, but it is smaller, more mobile, and more accurate. Its use of solid fuel rather than liquid simplifies handling. The Army plans to replace the Corporal with this weapon in the near future. Behind Corps, the field army covers an area 100 to 500 miles on a side. The Redstone, with a range of approximately 200 miles, provides the field army with a weapon to augment or supplant tactical air support and artillery fire. The army will need to have Redstones available for some time yet, until it is able to replace all Redstones in the field with the smaller and more mobile Pershing which will have a range well in excess of that of the Redstone and will use solid fuel rather than liquid. The Army's firepower also includes a devastating and flexible family of air defense weapons with which the Army can fill its very important mission of helping provide for the defense of American cities against air attack. Beginning with Nike Ajax, the Army developed the first operational surface-to-air missile system for defense of the continental United States and our forces overseas. The Ajax is now being replaced with a more versatile Nike Hercules, which can carry either a high explosive or atomic warhead, and which has successfully engaged targets at ranges in excess of 75 miles and at an altitude of 100,000 feet. The Army's plans call for eventual replacement of this weapon with even more powerful versions. Hawk, which can carry many types of warheads can provide protection against low-flying aircraft. The Army plans to develop a system with both greater range and higher altitude capability in the near future. An important part of the Army's air defense is the intricate electronic system known as Missile Master, which can control and coordinate the fires of all Army anti-aircraft weapons. As was stated earlier, Hand in hand with the Army's increased firepower is the matter of successfully locating targets for weapons to hit. With weapons which can fire up to 200 miles, the reconnaissance techniques of World War II are ineffective. Even the observation of artillery targets from aircraft, which was the beginning of improved reconnaissance techniques, now must keep pace. The Army needs observation aircraft, which can move speedily through the skies, equipped with target detection devices, which can pick up targets deep in enemy territory, such as this concentration of enemy missiles suggests. Such equipment, with an all-weather day or night capability, must be able to relay information to fire control units rapidly. So targets can be destroyed in a matter of minutes. The Army envisions the use of unmanned drones and other aircraft of many kinds in which the latest target detection devices can be employed. The Army will continue in the foreseeable future to need tanks because of their particular ability to live and operate on any kind of battlefield, including atomic. The Army is short of its requirements in modern medium tanks today and it needs to acquire these at the same time it is developing better tanks. It is making progress toward meeting this need. In the future, it will need a main battle tank that will be faster and lighter, with atomic firepower of its own. Armored personnel carriers are better today than those used in World War II and the Army is making progress in acquiring personnel carriers that can do everything the current one does but do it faster and at the same time be light enough to be carried by air into the battle area. The greatest recent development in mobility has been the evolution of aircraft which can carry troops in the battle area. Aircraft which can travel close to the ground below radar range. Helicopters can also be used effectively for reconnaissance. 
for the evacuation of wounded and for supply. The dramatic development of the helicopter as a weapon of war is continuing at a rapid pace. And there are now in various stages of research or production several models with very important applications for the Army. Fixed-wing aircraft can perform some of the same duties that helicopters can, and others under certain conditions. Development of even more powerful fixed-wing aircraft with short takeoff and landing capabilities holds much promise. Another aircraft with important applications is one with a helicopter's capability for vertical ascent and descent, combined with the flight capabilities of a fixed-wing plane. Aircraft also increase the mobility of the logistical support which must follow our forces into combat. The importance of logistical support by air will continue to grow as technology develops aerial equipment which can transport heavier loads. But most logistical support will continue to move on the ground and it is imperative that it be able to keep up with our mobile fighting units. The two-and-a-half-ton workhorse, however valiant a job it has done in the past, is not capable of meeting the much more rigorous demands of the shifting, fast-moving battle area of the future. And the Army is programming now for trucks superior to that honored vehicle. But even these will not completely meet the requirement, and the Army is making an intensive study of the kind of wheeled vehicles needed in the atomic age. At the same time, the Army is reducing its logistical burden through standardization of parts and reduction in size of equipment. Here is an example. This radio equipment used by the soldier in Korea will soon be reduced to a radio with helmet receiver and pouch type transmitter. And eventually, it will be possible to reduce the equipment to the size of a fountain pen. The Army is also reducing its logistical burden by transporting the great amounts of fuel our forces require in flexible pipelines, collapsible bulk fuel tanks, giant tires which can carry fuel inside them and other devices. But the most substantial alleviation of the problem will come when the Army is able to increase the use of diesel engines or engines which will operate on a wide range of fuels. The ultimate answer would be a new concept in fuel, a chemical fuel which would free the army from petroleum. Army scientists are today experimenting with exotic fuels in the constant hope of achieving a breakthrough in this area. As the army seeks constantly to perfect its tactical concepts to the changing conditions of war, the need for special new equipment is made known. Armed helicopters with which the army is experimenting today provide one example. Used as reconnaissance vehicles, these machines can lead the way for a task force by moving quickly into an area, firing into it, taking advantage of the terrain to hide, and drawing the enemy's fire, they can estimate the amount of enemy resistance and quickly call on firepower from the rear. On the future battlefield, of course, firing helicopters are not going to be found, for the helicopter was never designed to carry armament. But the need has clearly been shown for aerial assault vehicles, and with these firing helicopters, techniques are being developed for use with better equipment which will be available later. Aerial assault vehicles of the future are not in the realm of fantasy. Some of the Army's research and development effort is now being devoted to developing such vehicles as these, which will employ tactical concepts that are being perfected with Army aircraft today. Behind the aerial assault vehicles come ships carrying troops, 
and equipment. Once again, the air vehicles which will accomplish these functions in the future will be considerably different from those doing the job today. More efficient and reliable, less vulnerable to enemy fire. But it is the helicopter which has demonstrated not only the feasibility, but the effectiveness of this kind of operation. What you have seen in this report is a representative sampling of some of the weapons and equipment which will provide the Army with the firepower, mobility, communications and surveillance ability, and logistical support, which will enable it to accomplish its mission with maximum effectiveness. Today, our Army does not possess all the material which is needed for the support of its forces as a deterrent or as a counter to Soviet aggression. Taking into account both quality and quantity, the Army has about half its highest priority requirement. The Army is making a dedicated effort to meet these needs. It is an effort of vital national significance. In the troubled and tense world in which we live, the flames of war lie smoldering in all the danger areas where passions and aspirations and antagonisms struggle for expression. And our potential enemy has shown his desire to fan these flames to his own purpose. In the face of this threat, the role of the United States Army in the coming years is first of all to provide as part of a tri-service team a maximum contribution to the deterrence of war. Such power comes only through preparedness. To deter war, the Army must be ready to fight any kind of war with whatever weapons the situation demands. To win war, if war cannot be deterred, the Army must be equipped for victory. The Army stands today alert and responsive to the nation's will in company with its sister services, the Navy and Marines and the Air Force. It is trained and reorganized to meet the special and compelling demands of war in our day and in the future, as that future can be foreseen in the minds of men. To keep its reorganized form as effective as the spirit which motivates it, the Army's most compelling challenge is to keep its fighting units constantly girded with the modern weapons and equipment which provides superiority. For yesterday's finest weapons become today's second best and tomorrow are inadequate. This is the demanding truth which brings into clear and urgent focus the Army's never ceasing effort today to forge a sharper sword and stronger shield.